Good morning. morning. Welcome to chapel. Is it summer yet? (laughs) This morning, uh, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Angus Shaw. His bio says that he retired in 1998, but don't believe it. Uh, He has served as an interim pastor a dozen times or so uh, since then, and you'll find him in a pulpit Somewhere on most Sundays for 20 years, he pastored First Presbyterian Church in Johnson City. He's pastored in Pulaski and Marion and in Alabama uh, and probably lots of other places as well. He is the father of Dr. Karen Shaw. We are grateful that he's able to be with us uh, and to take time uh, out of his busy schedule to join us here at King University's Chapel. I invite you to stand and to join in the call to worship this morning. When they call to me, I will answer them, says the Lord. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With thanksgiving and praise, let us worship God. Our opening hymn is number 183. If you would please remain standing and sing with me, 183. seated. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin to God and one another. Please pray with me. Holy God, you lavish us with good gifts, yet we persist in seeking after that which robs us of abundant life. We hold fast to our anxieties and give in to our greed. We desire the very things that harm us. Forgive us, purify us, and sustain us by the strength of your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Word became flesh, not to condemn us, but to save us. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. What a privilege it is to be with you this morning for this chapel program. Our scripture this morning comes from an interesting episode in the life of our Lord with a blind man. Our Lord was on his way to Jerusalem and was in the Jericho area and we find 
this taking place. Hear God's word. And they came to Jericho. And as he was going out from Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, arise, he is calling for you. And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. It's a sobering experience for any of us to watch someone with a white cane in their hand tapping on the pavement as they make their way towards some destination. Or to watch someone holding on to the harness of a seeing eye dog. Our sight, what a blessing into it. Several years ago, in fact, probably a couple of decades ago, I was in a meeting here on the campus. I don't remember what the meeting was about, but when we finished and came out on the oval, I heard the tap, 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 and I watched a student with a white cane making his way along the oval. What a blessing it is to have sight David Redding, in one of his books on the miracles, wrote this. One of God's good ideas was to get some light out on creation and then to pass out to every person a pair of tiny windows so everyone could see what he was doing. Who can fathom what a fairy tale it is to wake up in the morning with your own private eyes, two shining jewels to, to each one, to see for ourselves the dazzling splendor of day and night. Our eyes open sesame. The stars dancing on black velvet. Falling petals of snow. Daffodils drifting in a sea of gold. The face of a young child lifted in prayer. Our other presence may seem small beside our sight. What right have you and I to grumble when we weigh the deficit? It, pa it goes the other way. What color are yours? Brown? Blue? Green? Ah, to see. What a blessing. Now, I want to learn some lessons from this Bartimaeus account. Don't run for the exit. At least not yet. This message has five or uh, seven points. We should be through here by 1230. <laughs> now if I talk that long, it may result in what happened in a northern city when the evangelist Dwight L. Moody was holding a crusade. They asked one of the local pastors to come and pray. So he came to the lectern and he prayed. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. And finally, Dr. Moody came up beside him and said, as our brother finishes his prayer, let's sing him 210. <laughs> let's look at this account. First of all, as we watch as Bartimaeus sits there by the roadside begging, we see, first of all, a need. As we pause and look at his life, we realize like a neon sign blinking at us, 
need, need, need. He was blind, sitting in his dark, despairing existence there. He was poor. Thread by a bare garments from somebody else's closet that he was wearing. He hated to beg. He was sidelined. He was out of the activities that most folks were involved in. There was a need, blind, stricken with need. But secondly, there was a desire for something better. A desire for something more. I don't know how much Bartimaeus knew about this traveling preacher, Jesus of Nazareth. Perhaps he had heard some of the amazing events, the lives that he had reached out and touched with healing and purpose and meaning along his pilgrimage. Perhaps he had heard of that little woman plagued with disease, had spent most of her money for healing and was still sick, and she reached out and touched the hem of his garment and was healed. Per perhaps he had heard of the feeding of 5,000 with a lad's picnic lunch. Or perhaps that man that lived in the tombs, in the cemetery, that he touched and healed with his grave. There was a need. There was a cry, a, a desire for more. And thirdly, there was a cry for help. This needy man with an unconquerable desire for something better than his meager existence cried out. You see, hope, hope was walking by in the person of Jesus Christ. Hope, hope. And so he cried out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me. And the crowd, irritated with this noisy one, sternly reprimanded him. But he cried out the more, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me. Notice the sequence. There was a need. There was a desire. There was a cry for help. And fourthly, there was the attention of Jesus. My young friend, don't let this escape you. Notice how Mark recorded the words, and Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, arise, he is calling for you. Now this is amazing grace, that a beggar could cry out and stop the Lord Jesus in his tracks. It reached, his cry reached the sensitive ear of Jesus, and he stopped, and it's always been that way. Our Lord is aware of our needs. Our cries get His full attention. He's never too busy. He's never too occupied. Never are we insignificant in His sight. The cry stopped the Lord in His tracks. I think the hymn writer caught it when he wrote, Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And he doesn't. He hears. He has time for us. He had time for that influential, educated Nicodemus who came to him in the middle of the night to find out about life and life eternal. And he had time for Nicodemus. He had time for Bartimaeus who had never seen him, but wanted to. They stopped the Lord in his tracks. They got his undivided attention. Notice the sequence. A need, a desire, a cry for help, and the undivided attention of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then fifthly, 
getting rid of that which hampers. Now notice carefully how Mark wrote this account. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take courage, arise. He is calling for you and casting aside his cloak. He jumped up and came to Jesus. Bartimaeus, if you please, got rid of anything that would hamper or hinder his coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes our problem, yours and mine, is that we don't get rid of that which hampers us or hinders us coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our modern Christian era, so often we're not willing to lay aside that which hampers us. We are so encumbered with secondaries that we so often missed the priorities. There are times when you and I need to lay aside that which hampers our reception of Jesus Christ and our following of Him. I heard some time ago a method of capturing monkeys. I don't know why they wanted the monkeys, but they would take a barrel and fill it with coconuts and then seal it. And then in the side of the barrel, they'd put a small hole just large enough for a monkey to get his paw or his hand through it, and then he'd wrap it around a coconut. Now, he could not get his hand out as long as he held on to the coconut. And rather than have his freedom, he held on to the coconut. And they'd come up and pick him up and capture him. Sometimes there are habits and schedules and things that occupy your life and my life that we need to lay aside. Let's not let any of this stuff keep us from our Lord and from following His grace. Notice the sequence. Need, desire for something better, a cry for help, the attention of our Lord Jesus Christ and then getting rid of anything that hamper, hampers. And then sixthly, we see sight. After getting rid of that which hampered, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And Christ asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight. Oh, the blessing of being able to say, Oh, I see. I see. Bartimaeus, for him a new day dawned. The shadows fled away. And the miracle in the life of Bartimaeus was twofold. He was not only cured of his physical illness, but he's also healed of his spiritual blindness. What a supreme miracle of our encounter with Jesus. Whenever I read this story, I go back to when I was your age. Now folks, that was a long time ago. I mean a long time ago. I was sitting in chapel at the university I was attending. And they had a, a guest speaker. They brought him into the platform. Tall, muscular, handsome man. His name was Don Mumal. Don Mumal at that time was an all-American football player from UCLA. He had what every red-blooded American youth would want. He had fame. His name was splashed on the media and sport pages across the world. 
He had recognition everywhere he went. Folks wanted to speak to him. He had applause. He had influence. He had the opportunity of a lucrative job after college. But Don Mumaw was blind spiritually. There was something missing in his life. There was a big vacancy inside. He wasn't sure what it was, but he decided to do something about it. And he, so he called and made an appointment with, with, to meet with Dr. Bill Bright. Dr. Bright was an elder in the Presbyterian Church, and he was the one who began Campus Crusade for Christ. Don Mumal came into his office, and they sat down and talked. And Bill Bright presented to him the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for, before Don Mumbaugh left that office, that big giant of a man was down on his knees asking the Lord Jesus to come into his life as Savior and Lord. He didn't go on to play football. He went to seminary and became the pastor of some large Presbyterian churches on the West Coast. Before he finished his testimony at that chapel program, I never forget the words that sort of captured what has happened to him. He said, whereas once I was blind, now I see. What a difference it makes. But there's a seventh lesson. This blind poor beggar had an encounter with the Lord Jesus, received his sight spiritually and physically, and then the scripture says, note it very carefully, he began following him on the road. Now, the Greek word that is used here is what we call lineal action. It's a continual action verb form that Bartimaeus kept on, kept on, kept on following him on the road. And then Dr. Luke, his account of this miracle, he sums it up this way. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. The evidence of spiritual sight is discipleship, following him on the road. I like the way William Barclay summed up this miracle. Listen to his words. Having received his sight, he followed Jesus. He did not selfishly go his way when his need was met. He began with a need, went on to gratitude, and finished in loyalty. And that's the perfect summary of the stages of discipleship. I want to close this morning with a couple of paragraphs from a book entitled Cross in the Marketplace. And I would ask you the question as I come to this closure, how well do you see? And are you following Jesus in the way? Foy Valentine writes, I am recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on the town garbage heap, at the crossroads so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek, at the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble. Because that is what he died about. And that is where churchmen should be and what churchmanship should be about. What shall we do? 
you and I. We shall renew our vows to God. We shall not forsake the assembling of ourselves together is the man of some. We shall be good stewards of all that we have and are and hope to be. We shall preach the gospel. We shall not wince at the scandal of the cross. We shall be swimmers against the tide. And if any man would come after Christ, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. How are you and I doing? Have we come to see him and to follow him along the road faithfully? May God use us no matter what our age to glorify his name and to cause his name to be praised. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. I invite you to stand as together we affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord, we hear your words of life and hope and are strengthened. We are grateful that you attend to our prayers, that you hear our cries. And as we gather this morning, we pray for all of those among us and those we are mindful of who are in need of your healing from illness. We remember those who were recently diagnosed. We remember those who have been injured, those who suffer from chronic pain, and those who are recovering. Grant them strength and healing and uphold all of those who care for them, doctors, and nurses, and family, and friends. We pray for those who are in need of your comfort and encouragement, to those who were weighed down by grief. Lord, bring the light and peace of your presence. To those this morning who were burdened by worries and anxieties about relationships, or finances, or other responsibilities. Grant courage and peace. This morning, Lord, we pray for the cares and needs in this community and in the world. We remember before you those who do not have enough to eat, those who do not have clean water to drink, or a place to stay. We pray that you will increase in us and in others generosity enough to share our resources in life-giving ways. All of these prayers we offer with the confidence of your children and in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our closing hymn is number 700. It's a wonderful spiritual and it works well in the Dr. Shaw's message. Please stand and sing with me. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to work so God can use me anywhere. you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And God's people said, Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>